Historiography is the study of how we write about history, the lenses we use, and the narrative we construct. Civ is one such lens and narrative. It can sound a bit circular, writing about the way we write about history, but actually it's a fundamental part of the process of doing history. History is not the same thing as the past, and historians would never claim an exact certainty on events, the same way scientists do not speak in absolutes. It follows that where scientists will test hypotheses proposed by other researchers, historians will discuss the interpretations of events laid out by other historians. On one level, this can be like mutually agreeing two events happened, but disagreeing on the relationship between them. Did the uprising cause a famine, or did the famine cause an uprising? Was it this policy, or that policy? But on another, historiography is also the discussion of bias. History would like to be a pile of objective facts ready to be observed, but we are not so lucky. Instead, history becomes a generally agreed upon narrative, which in turn has interpreters seeking to weave together their own conclusions on how we got where we are today. Sometimes this culminates in something as broad as a world history textbook. Sometimes it's something as narrow as a biography of Abraham Lincoln. In the former case, historiography would probably include discussion of what history is to include in world history, quote unquote, taking into account things like audience and relevance. And in the latter case, it's why we have 200 biographies of one man. Let's look at two games, Sid Meier's Civilization V and Civilization VI, and how they respectively view history, both in relation to each other and to the broader context of historiography. Civilization as a series, broadly, has always attempted to tell the same story. Now, as to what that story is, quite obviously, it's the tale of human history, of civilizations. Clarified a bit in interviews, the inspiration was simple but effective tellings of history replete with fun facts aimed at children. Will that come back up? Absolutely. Let's look at how the two games approach civics, that is, cultural innovations, as opposed to, say, technological ones. Individual entries in the Civilopedia, the in-game historical and gameplay resource, undergo subtle changes between series entries. But the separation of civics from text in 5 and the introduction of a timeline-oriented tree in 6 gives us two things we could compare. 1. Broadly, the way civics themselves are approached in a lens of linear cultural progression, and 2. More narrow, the treasure trove that is newly defined civics. For now, let's look at the civic definitions and how they compare. We'll come back to the timeline in the next section. Keep it in mind. How do the two games define the same idea? Let's look at capitalism, in Civ V merely a tenant of the freedom ideology. Capitalism is an economic system based on private production and ownership of goods, driven by the production of goods and services for profit. There are several types of capitalism, such as laissez-faire capitalism, welfare capitalism, and state capitalism. Most modern states have some form of mixed capitalism, with varying degrees of government-controlled and market-driven entrepreneurship. That's the entire definition in-game. Alternatively, Civ VI has a lot more to say, and rather than give us a dry paragraph, it tells a story conflating the history of commerce and labor with capitalism, as far back as prehistory. Now, it may not be a perfect parallel, because it's not a description of a civic, rather a government form, but communism does not have the same winding origin story, nor does it gloss over the failings and practical realities. It even admits to being, quote, in theory more of an economic system rather than a system of government, which is correct and contradictory to the game itself. Now let's look at this historiographically and see what we can conclude. Civ V handed us a definition of an economic model, where Civ VI has given us a history, a narrative. Rather than the neutral statement everyone would agree with, we get a story with flair and claims that open the door to disagreement. 
Some historians would point to the idea that commerce and capital are far from similar. Others would call it anachronistic to tie the two together. We are handed a mix of fact and claim. Noteworthy to me is that capitalism's failings are incidental. The Great Depression is a hiccup in Civ VI's words. Capitalism's connection to colonialism is a thing of the past, a relic of origin, rather than a living element of it. Tangible examples of countries using the capitalist model are not included, left instead to being just a theory among many. Communism, as a parallel, is afforded no such treatment. It would be fair to conclude that the authors have presented a bias. To give another example of a similar critique, let's look at another civic, Reformed Church. Reformed Church is the civic which unlocks theocratic government. It predominantly refers to the Protestant Reformation, and then gestures towards the idea that other faiths have also had reforms in history, with no temporal context given for those. Immediately, there's an issue. Theocracies are locked behind a civic that is focused on the advent of arguably a more secular compatible religion. As a small irony, without the Reformation, theocratic government would not be available. That the papacy would not be a theocracy without reform is unambiguously absurd. And perhaps the counterpoint would simply be, it's not that deep. But one element of historiography is exploring where a narrative spends its focus. What is allowed to remain a popular abstraction, and what is given significant nuance. Put simply, doing history is about choosing what to gloss over and how. And as such, historiography is asking why. This is not some takedown of Civ, or me saying Civ's creators are lazy, so much as that the moments without nuance betray a bias. Capitalism gets a simple story of tale as old as time had some hiccups, a children's history version, where communism gets a dedicated list of countries that tried it and how they failed or how ideologically inconsistent they ended up being. Reformed Church gets to be a whole civic that only has a clear example given for the Western world, for Christianity, and a hand wave for other Abrahamic faiths mentioned in name but given no examples within the timeline. Speaking of timeline, beyond examples of what is written, one could also take the placement of texts and civics in a timeline as another form of text, so to speak. We can understand an author's view by what they presuppose, and Civ presupposes a fair bit. A central element of the games is that one tech leads to another. That itself stands to reason on a base level, and I would even say is uncontroversial, though could still bear some scrutiny. Culture, however, is different, and this issue only arises from a change in policies between 5 and 6. We must, thus, when reading the account of history, assume an intent behind where civics fall within the timeline. Civ VI had to create a culture timeline where there never was one before. For gameplay, it may make sense that the three ideological civics, class struggle, suffrage, and totalitarianism, emerge simultaneously and, from the same previous tech, ideology. It means that players can make their choice between the three at the same time. As such, the ideology trio create an interesting and confusing dilemma. Liberal democracy relies on the discovery of suffrage, which is a modern era civic. So what do they mean? Who is now voting that wasn't before? Do they mean universal suffrage? Suffrage for women? Why does it arise at the same time as class struggle and fascism? The Renaissance and medieval governments unlocked distinct from each other, staggered in some way. Viewed in this way, it becomes hard to read in either direction. Prioritizing gameplay like this isn't how the other civics have been organized so far. The staggered medieval and renaissance ones are directly in the path of general cultural advancement. Ignoring gameplay, for the sake of history, certainly isn't happening, because history does not dictate the three modern ideologies sprang forth simultaneously. Even if, and it's a big if, we presume communism and class struggle only really existed once the Soviet Union was formed, that still gives us years before the rise of fascism, and is very much distant from the establishment of liberal democracy, 
Unless we are assuming liberal democracies don't count until women can vote and the suffrage civic really is about women. The Pedia entry and quote suggest that, but that would, by the Civilopedia's own admission, date suffrage's discovery to anywhere from 1848 to 1920 if we assume the US is the model of discovery here. Without historiography, there would be no discussion like this. The depictions of history would be uncritically valid, and one might walk away from it thinking the ideologies of the 20th century all sprouted at once. By knowing history and debating this argument, we realize that it's not an issue of simplification, but being unable to present a compelling argument of being wrong. Let's look at Civ 5 and the crossroad of narrative and Framing. Omission. Civ 5 was the beginning of emphasizing the contemporary ideological conflict of fascism, communism, and capitalism. It came to the game on the wings of an expansion. It's genuinely interesting that they did not, at that point, expand the definitions of the tenets to match what would later become the civics. It feels a bit lacking, despite being the focus of an expansion, but it also is fairly fleshed out compared to Civ VI. Your ideology grows and has tiers of component tenets. You pick from a list of ideology-specific tenets rather than a shared pool of policy cards. I don't think this could be read historiographically unless we take the very broad understanding that Civ VI no longer believes in nuance, that there's something to be read in how VI merely offers policy slots, not a specific set of policies, but I kind of doubt that. Alternatively, there is the issue of how it feels like Civ V refuses to use real-world terms of communism and fascism and almost doesn't use the word fascism at all, where at least it makes a passing mention of communism and Marx with respect to tenant descriptions. Civ VI gets rid of the ambiguity. Fascism is a government, as opposed to communism and democracy. With respect to five, this ambiguity of what autocracy refers to comes back to bite it pretty hard. Most of the autocracy stuff is admitted to be very much not unique to fascism or autocracy, likely in part to avoid having to deal with letting players commit fascism. But in some ways, this almost becomes an accidental critique of liberal democracies. A majority of these tenets are described as tactics used by Western states in the 1800s onwards, elements of colonialism. I doubt this is cheeky and subversive so much as a mask slip. Image has become a casualty to truth for once. Or more likely, tenets are just kind of chaotically slapped together to match vague popular perceptions. Tenets in five have one overlap between the three ideologies, universal healthcare. Going beyond that, most of them make no sense in reality. United Front, in its own description, is a communist thing but then it's tied to autocracy. Colonialism stuff under Britain is autocratic, even though the game codes freedom as a British ideology. It's just weird and messy, really messy. It's like they made a puzzle by gathering pieces of real history, and then they were surprised by the picture when they put it together. Civ V does mention colonialism, just like Civ VI, and they even organize the pieces but they refuse to click it together because doing so would run counter to their implicit worldview. What else could Civ VI do when half the descriptions for its stand-in for fascism end up applying to historical liberal democracies? And that's another form of doing history, to lay bare the facts and either come to the conclusion despite them, or to refuse to admit a conclusion exists for the sake of narrative cohesion. It's less writing out the messy parts and more neglecting to go there. It's a mix of the two previous sections. It's a use of framing to create a narrative. Ultimately, one of the most strange and damning things about Civ as a whole is that it presents itself as an encyclopedia, one of common knowledge, accepted truths, and when combined with the fact that it's just a game, ends up having no compulsion towards giving sources. This is a double-edged sword. It means the game positions itself as neutral and objective enough to be uncontroversial, but it also means that anyone who does the bare minimum of reading even Wikipedia has done more of an academic exercise than Civ. Nonetheless, they have 
done history, and as such, opened themselves to become part of historiography. I get that it's not a paper up for peer review, but lacking sources means we can distrust anything they say. It behooves us to question their bias all the more. Without the Civilopedia, it might be fair to say that this game deserves a media analysis at most, a critique as a game. But with that pedia, it takes on a higher responsibility, that of an educational source of knowledge, and as such, a different lens for scrutiny. Allowing me to talk about historiography for 15 minutes. I hope it all made sense, because this is the introduction to a broader series where I'll be using history games to explain real-world academic historical concepts like I did with this one. Next time, we'll be using EU4 to talk about great men theory. Maybe like, subscribe if you don't want to miss it, and if you don't want to wait for more content, check out these other things I've made. Or don't. Live slow. Die whenever. Bye.